as I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I've been seeing this thing for like four meetings. I was like, I need to move that. <laughs> Okay, uh, so what we are going to do is, this is a panel, and in the panel what we do is we do two questions, and in what we'll do is whenever I do the question, uh, they will have ten minutes to come up and talk about the topic, and then, uh, and then the next person will do it, and then the next person, and then I will tell them the next topic. They don't know what the topics are. Yeah. I don't even know what the topics are. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, so and uh, so what I'm going to do is whenever you're, when I'm going to sit down there, when it comes to doing I do that, you got one more minute, okay? All right. Or just don't go by it and talk anyway, talk more. So anyway, okay, so what I'm going to do is the first topic is going to be what is the hardest thing that you've dealt with in recovery and we will go with Craig first My name's Craig. I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) I'm glad he gave me a really easy question to start off with. Uh, God, I'm not going to get, I'll go here. Okay, so uh, I think the hardest thing that I've had to deal with since, uh, since I got sober, we'll we'll just do a, a brief rundown. So I, I was uh, I was the kind of alcoholic I'd show up in AA, and I hated y'all, and I was in and out for years, in and out for years, and uh, but I never I never worked with a sponsor, I never did any of that that stuff. I, w- I would come to some meetings here and there, y'all would sign my paper for the parole office, and then uh, and then I'd leave. Uh, and so when I got sober this time, I. Uh, I was very heavy handed big book like that. That's, that's the meetings that I got sober in. And, uh, I don't know if y'all have experienced the guy with 90 days sober telling the people with uh, 30 years sober, how they're doing it wrong. <laughs> I am that guy. And, uh, and so I'm making friends everywhere I go. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I, because I'm, I'm a sensitive alcoholic, I, uh, I go into those same meetings and I wonder why they don't like me. And I, I'm like, they didn't come up and hug me. They didn't come up and shake my hand. And I'm over here like, your stupid cliches and one-liners are killing the newcomer, you know. And uh, so, it, COVID happened, and I was, I guess, about five years sober when uh, when when COVID took place. And so. What I knew of AA was very, uh, man, I'm in the treatment center all the time. I'm sponsoring dudes at the local halfway houses. Uh, I'm very service oriented and I'm not very unity oriented. And my fiance, who's down there in the first row, I remember when, when COVID happened, it was, uh, she didn't want me to go sponsor dudes because, you know, like we're watching videos of people flopping over dead in China and, you know, like shit, shit serious. And so she's like, I, I'd really appreciate it if you just stayed home. And um, after about two weeks of that, she's like, I don't care what you do. Just get out of this house. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the, the, the meetings were shut down. The treatment obligations were shut down. And, uh, my recovery looked really different. And, um, and what, what I realized probably in 2020 and 2021 is that I had, uh, I'd gotten very rigid with God. 
I'd gotten very rigid with Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd gotten very rigid with what service looked like. And I don't know where I thought that like God had told me like the definitions of these things were, but in my mind, I'm like, listen, if you're not in the treatment center and you're not sponsoring dudes, then like you're not doing service. I told you people loved me everywhere I went. And, <laughs> and so it was like the unlearning of everything in that year was, was super difficult and That's happening in, you know, this is home to me. Alcoholics Anonymous is home. Like, I, like, it's the first place I really felt like I belonged other than a trap house or a bar. Y'all love me. Y'all put up with a bunch of my nonsense. And I don't have that. Home life's rocky because neither me nor my fiance knew how, to, like, you know, we're those, we're those idiots that got together in the first 90 days sober, and we still are together. So, uh, But, you know, you, you take away what we knew, and um, I went one way, she went another way. So home life's rocky, recovery life's rocky, and I'm, I'm having to realize I am wrong about so, so much. And I'm a prideful guy, so to admit to anybody like, I might, I might have screwed this up on how hard I was being on, on, on y'all and myself and everybody around me. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a challenging experience. I, I, it, but what it did is it drove me to, uh, I went to a conference similar to this. And... Uh, there was a man that sat in the front row who spoke on, on Sunday morning, and I watched that man, and uh, he came for every speech. Every stupid panel at 10 o'clock at night after every, like the good speakers have went, like, he's still there. And so, and he spoke, he talked about wheelhouse steps, the things that are your wheelhouse. And I, you know, I'm... I'm a 12-step dude. That's a wheelhouse step. I like doing that. It comes easy to me. What's not wheelhouse steps for me are the disciplines of 10 and 11. And he, he talked about those being his wheelhouse steps. So for the first time in a long time, I, I made a decision that uh, I'm going to go with somebody that might know about some stuff that I don't know about, which is 10 and 11. Like, I mean, I can, I can quote you the book. But I don't have the practices in my everyday life. And uh, as much as I hate Zoom meetings, I, me and that man met every Sunday with uh, five other dudes. And we worked through the steps. He taught me a whole lot. And he, he helped me to unlearn my rigidness that sometimes still comes to the forefront in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. He taught me how to... Uh, extend some grace to other people in my life that is, is not my not my strong suit but that was probably the toughest part in recovery for me was learning that I was wrong about 90% of the stuff that I you know uh, I listen I love the big book I, to this day I absolutely love the big book if you ask me to sponsor you we're going line through line through the big book but we're not going to break out the pitchforks if we can handle it. You know, sometimes, you know, you need a pitchfork. But uh, that's probably been the toughest thing for me is uh, one of my friends told me the last time I spoke that I didn't share this. And he called me names that I don't think you're supposed to use from a podium. But uh, I went to a Dead & Company concert in Chicago. Grateful Dead fans, any of y'all? No, no. Is that more a drug addicts anonymous meeting than an alcoholics anonymous meeting? But so I went to a Guns N' Roses concert and I went to a Dead and Company concert, and um, I'm so ate up with fear and anxiety because I, I like confrontation with y'all. I hate confrontation with my fiance, and so we're just pretending like everything's cool at home. It wasn't cool, was it? No, it was not cool. <laughs> and uh, I have a full-blown anxiety attack at this Dead & Company show. 
have to get, like, um, and you're know, like, it's a dead show. Like, they're on every drug known to man. And I'm, I'm over here, you know, sober as a judge. Like, I need you to check my heart out. <laughs> <laughs> they hooked me up to the machine and all of this. Um, but what I learned through that was that I need all three legs and not just the service leg. I needed the recovery piece that my sponsor that my sponsor offered me, and I needed the unity piece, and I needed to be the one to extend the olive branch out for the unity, rather than thinking y'all should just forgive me for being an asshat. Thank you. I'm all timer. Hi, y'all. My name is Ryan Corvo. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is June 10th of 2009, and for that day, I'm eternally grateful. I have a sponsor. His name is Dave Chadwell. He's a member of the Pleasant Valley Group, which I am too. Whoop, whoop. We got 10 of us sitting over here. And uh, uh, I sponsor men that I sponsor, sponsor men. They sponsor, sponsor. And you just go on down the line. There's like five generations of us probably sitting in this room right now, and it's really, really cool. Um, I want to thank Ben for dropping this on me the other day. I was at work, I run to the warehouse, and I said, what are we talking about? I said, it's not your business, just show up. <laughs> and uh, so here we are. Um, I'm sitting here thinking, and thank you for your, for your talk, and uh, what, a, what an amazing thing this is. And I got to hear Charlie Parker, one of my absolute AA giants, that helped save my life, tell that story. And whew, so I'm a hot mess anyway. Um, but I can tell you, I've taken the 12 steps, and I've had a spiritual awakening as the result of those steps. And um, my life... I can tell you with absolute certainty my life has forever changed. But the most important fact I want to tell you is that everybody's life that come in contact with me since that day has changed. Um, I can get a little wound up sometimes, but life is not a veil of tears for me today. And I've been through a lot of stuff in sobriety. And the book Alcoholics Anonymous says when we look back, we see that we put ourselves in God's hands, remarkable things happen. And I'm sitting here, to God's honest truth, 100% transparency, is like, geez, what was the hardest thing in my sobriety? I think, you know, there's several different things, and one of them is just getting out of my own way and my own selfishness that they've been talking about tonight. Um, but it's people like you in conferences like this that get me grounded and keep me solid in the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I get to see, like my friend here, it's 21 years. I mean, how amazing is that? And my sobriety day is June 10th. If, if uh, I keep doing this stuff right here... Uh, by God's grace, on June 10th, I just found out one year sober, that was A's birthday, I'll be 14 years in this deal. You know, how cool is that? There's a whole lot of L-I-F-E between year one and year 14. But I'm going to tell you, if you're new in this room, just sit down and hold on, guys. I'm going to tell you, you're 12 steps away from the most magical life you've ever possibly ever could even imagine. And if you're in here, you're not out there. If you're out there, you don't have a chance. And it takes you and I to spell that word unity. If you haven't seen it here this weekend, your eyes aren't open. Without you, there is no I. And, and one of the things I'll tell you very quickly, I, I'm running my hard drive because really, even when it's bad, it's good. My friend Ben and I were just talking about that. When I'm in the bad spot, it don't seem like it's really good. But because of this big book, a sponsor and these, these rooms, and um, I can get through it peace and dignity. Never once do I ever fathom about thinking about picking up a drink. Not even, even, it's not even an option. Those 10-step promises are real. And at five years sober, I was going through a custody battle. I come in here, a train wreck, low-bottom alcoholic, as outlined in the book. I'm the real alcoholic, and I can tell you there's a big carnage behind my story. None of that matters, but there's a lot of stuff behind it. And one of them was a, was a really bad uh, divorce and a custody battle with a son. And I drug that through. I mean, I was surrendered to alcohol, and I had a spiritual awakening. And the bottle did that for me. And I gave that problem to you, and you guys walked me through that, and that problem was removed. But you take away, you grab my security with my children, and something else happens. And I fought that, and I fought that into the ditch. I fought that for years. I had lawyers. I mean, I spent every dime we had, and I'm going to be transparent. I run myself into Chapter 7 bankruptcy. If you played Monopoly, it was bust. My beautiful wife was there today. I got a custody agreement, and I won. I won. I get to see Bradley again. Well, she took him and moved to another state and took off. You see, I'd done so much damage never one time that I think what that little boy was going through. Because of me against her and her against me. 
You see, I didn't listen to that sponsor, what you guys told me. I didn't make use of what your experience is. But at five years sober, I hit my knees in that very same spot that I did when I asked God for help with alcohol, and I gave it to God. And I'm free of that today. I don't wake up with my jaws clenched. And I would love to sit here and tell you that I have a beautiful relationship with that boy, but that's not the case. But I know in God's time, it'll be there. I know that boy's over 18 now, and he's doing well because my son keeps in contact with him. But for right now, it's just not there. But I know if I keep doing this and keep coming here, God will make that possible when it's time. And there's something I'm going through right now that I need to share. It's difficult. My last run, I love Tennessee. My dad took me to a treatment center in Knoxville twice. He took me and dumped me off. My dad don't tell me he loves me. He's a great man. He's not an alcoholic. He cried and said, Ryan, last time I'll probably ever see you, you'll probably be in a pine box. I'm going to live my life. You better go back to that AA, do what they say. And he left me in Knoxville, Tennessee. I can tell you 14 years later. I'm the, uh, I'm the executor of his estate. I'm his power of attorney. I'm his doctor. I'm his caregiver. I cook him meals every night of the week. I do his banking for him. He's slipping into dementia. And every day that man comes to my house and tells me the same story. But because of God and Alcoholics Anonymous, I said, that's so cool, Dad. That's so cool. Hey, Pops, I'll be over in a little bit. I'm in an AA meeting right now. But I'll be over to see you. Okay, okay. I can tell you my beautiful wife and I take care of him today. You see, he had a kid that couldn't stay sober, and he knew he had to deliver me to you. And you all did your job. Because you did your job, it's come full circle. I can do my job today. And no matter what, I'm from the no matter what club. Anything that man needs, I'm there. And for the, these men that are in my life, they know it. I don't talk about it because they see me doing it. So with God and Alcoholics Anonymous... I mean, anything's possible. I mean, anything's possible. If you're new, don't keep coming back, man. Just stay, because we need you. We need you more than you'll ever know. We need you more than anything, because what we know is something you don't. There's a life out there on the other side of this thing that's indescribably wonderful. And if you're one of those people who say, hey, you're on a pink cloud. I've been on a pink cloud for 14 years. You don't believe that? Hop up on mine, baby. It's big. You can ride her with me. I absolutely love you, and I love you, Ben. I'll pass. Thanks, guys. I'm David Gibbs. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date's May 16th, 1992. I belong to the Tennessee group down in Knoxville. Hey, uh... I, I have some similarities there with the custody thing when they said, what's the hardest thing you ever been through? And I immediately was drawn to what I went through. And probably it was the hardest thing that I went through because it was the first real dilemma in sobriety that I had to deal with. Because I I was running amok homeless with the kids because the ex who were actually married at the time ran off with some guy because I treated her so well. And I told her, if you ever take them kids from me again, I'll kill you. And I don't think I would have actually done it, but I needed her to believe it. And when I said it, she believed it. And so I put those kids in the car and we were homeless in the streets out in the desert in California. And I drove those kids around with me and I knew they were the last decent thing that I had in my life. And... uh and if I were to lose them, because I actually, there were times when I didn't take a drink. So I wouldn't get so drunk because I knew I had to get them something to eat that day or whatever, right? I mean, it was the only decent thing I had left and it didn't stop me from drinking. It just stopped me. It made me think about other things. And, uh, and it eventually led me to, to a surrender where I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous not thinking that I was going to really get sober long term and stay sober I just thought I'll have to clean my act up one more time and AA is a good place to do that it worked three times before but I just couldn't get myself 
back together this time, and I had to surrender those kids to her through the custody battle and all that stuff, and it's it tears your guts out, man. I had two little girls, they were four and eight years old, and they were so innocent, and they had nothing to do with what happened between me and their mother. And they're talking about God and all this stuff in AA, and, and I'm, I've been mocking God for years. Not just in my words, but the way I lived. And I came in, and I knew I wasn't worthy of that, but I did have a spiritual experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. Or right before I came, the night before I got sober, I had an overwhelming spiritual experience. When I got here and they said, having had a spiritual experience as a result of the steps, I went, whew. Thank God I don't have to go through all them damn steps. I had that already, you know. And so it prevented me from working steps for a while. And I didn't really do anything. And, and, uh, and my life just kept getting miserable. And in about six months, I finally asked my sponsor, you got to help me. And he started taking me through these steps. And he started teaching me things like what Charlie Parker talked about tonight. And how myself had manifested itself in so many ways that I was so disengaged from the rest of the world. It was amazing. And I had a hard time conceiving of those things. And then when I got to be a little over a year sober in one of those hearings, they granted me full sole custody of my two daughters. And... Uh, and I, like you, I was like, I won, you know, and it was all about winning and, 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 and I beat her. And then about a week later, I'm like, I have no clue what I'm doing. Right. And, uh, but I couldn't let you know that it was about, I'm the great dad. And what I've been doing over the last year has gained me full custody of my daughters because I'm so freaking great. And she's such a piece of crap. And. I hid the inferiority complex that I had because, um, because I had to. That's what I do. And my sponsor started talking to me. And uh, I think he maybe hinted around to some of the women in AA about what was going on with me and my kids. Because they would ask me things like, Dave, we had a little back room in the meeting hall and the kids could go back there if you had kids and they could color and play with toys and stuff, and I'd bring my kids while I was in the meeting, and and uh, they'd say, glad you got your kids back, Dave. Uh, what have you been feeding them? Because they got dark circles under their eyes, and do you, got, do you guys have a hairbrush at the house, by the way? And these were insulting things to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm feeding them. I'm like, well, what are you feeding them, Dave? And I'm like, well, last night they had frozen pizza. And macaroni and cheese. What did they have the night before? Frozen pizza. Macaroni and cheese. <clears throat> so these women in AA decided to come over to my house on a Saturday and take me grocery shopping and teach me how to shop for fresh vegetables and fruits and things that my kids needed that I didn't realize was so important. I just didn't know. In the back of my mind, you know, when I think about it now, I go, how could I not know those things? How could I not go and do that stuff for my kids? And it was the hardest thing for me to do is to lay down what I thought I was doing a good job because I had my kids for a short time. And I was, I mean, they seemed to be fairly happy and everything. But they taught me how to comb their hair and braid their hair before they went to school. And they taught me how to take their clothes and make them match. You know, you can't send them with a, a yellow sock and a green sock and a purple shirt and red pants, Dave. It just, it ain't going to work, you know. And, and, uh, and they helped me to develop a routine with that. And they taught me how to take care of my children. That's what they did. And the battle that was going on inside of me to be able to lay down my fixed ideas about I'm just doing fine and let these people come in and help me was probably the hardest thing that I ever had to do. I've had several hard things I've had to do over the years, but that was the hardest, and I think it's because the first time I was ever confronted with my idea of what it was going to be like for me in sobriety versus what real life in sobriety is all about. 
and, and to change one's attitude and mind and heart over to something else that was much better uh, was extremely difficult for me to do. Um, I got lucky, and somebody, like, had the hots for me, which I felt I didn't deserve, but I've been with her for 25 years, and as I grew with these girls in my home, um, we didn't live together for the first five years, and then me and Marion moved in together, but during the course of that time, Marion brought principle and structure into that house without even being there. And my kids, who hated her so much, because she was the woman, you know, it would have been an estrogen explosion to move in all together, all at once, you know. Because my kids were growing up, you know, and they were in their preteens and stuff, and and, uh, and she taught them how to be ladies. And I had to let her, and that was that was hard too. Is um, having to listen after raising the kids in the new AA fashion and then having Marion come in and say, this is how it needs to go. And you can't do that. And you can't cut me out. And, you know, and I'm like the king of the castle and I'm going to call all the shots. And now I have to start sharing those responsibilities. It was hard. And what does this have to do with sobriety? Well, when you're like me and you have to over... The hardest thing that I think we have to do, like Charlie talked about, is changing our ideas over into something else that is proper and right. And if you don't know, you don't know. When he said that today, man, I'm, I immediately thought of these things and other things that I've had to go through in sobriety. I mean, after 30 years of sobriety, I've been through a lot of hard things in sobriety, right? Right? Um, that I've had to do similar things, and they all have to do with my belief system and what I believe, because when I believe it and you challenge me, my chest comes out a little bit. And I get a little defensive about what you're telling me. And I don't want to hear it. And I don't want to think that that applies to me. And whenever I, I face any kind of controversy... Uh, since I've been sober, that happens to me. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. But I have to, at some point in time, during the process, process of that is to realize that I've been here before, I've overcome it before, with the help of God and AA, I can do these things. You know, And I've had to overcome a lot of things in order to uh, turn my will and my life over to the care of God in that fashion. And it's, uh, it's been the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life was take responsibility for those two girls because now I got grandkids from them. I raised them. They didn't get pregnant. They didn't get strung out on drugs. I didn't have to go to the principal's office. All those things that we think are, like, you know, good. You know, you don't want your kids ending up there, right? And... Uh, and uh, all, all in all, they, they turned out to be pr- pretty good ladies. And, uh, and they're raising some pretty good kids themselves now. So um, something worked, and it was not my idea. So thank you. Okay, so the second question, or topic is going to be what is the most profound amends that you've made since you've been sober? And we'll go with Craig again. (laughs) My name's Craig. I'm still an alcoholic. Uh, I'm going to do two, two different amends. Um, so I'll start with the one that, uh, so there, anybody that's from here, if you come from Kingsport to Johnson city, there's this church that they call the Hershey kiss church. Cause it looks like a Hershey kiss when you pass on the interstate. And, uh, 
Yeah, I'm about to own this in front of all these people. That's fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, my buddy worked at this church, and <laughs> do I look like I know how to pressure wash? Like, I look like a pressure washer. So I, I don't, I don't, it's, I got the beard now. Back then, I didn't have the beard, and I don't know how to pressure wash, and I didn't own a pressure washing business, and, uh, but my buddy worked there, and uh, we like to party, so, uh I robbed this church for ten thousand dollars, ten, twelve, something like that. Uh, yeah, typical stuff. Uh, so apparently, I ran a pressure washing business. We would invoice for the pressure washing that never happened. Church would cut a check. We'd go to Atlanta, blah blah blah. And uh, my current, my home group when I first got sober was in Johnson City, and I'm from Kingsport. So every time I'd go to my home group. I'd pass the Hershey Kiss Church, and I do this number when I'm driving on the interstate. It's over here, and I'm like looking off because I don't really like want to make eye contact with the Hershey Kiss Church because I'm full of the the shame of robbing a church. And um, I remember uh, my my first sponsor. He would uh, he would make he he had me do a contract in the beginning of the book, and you know I Craig Forster I'm willing to go to any links for victory over alcohol and drugs, and I saw, and I would put the date, and we signed that. And uh, I remember the first time when we met, he said, there's going to come a day when I'm going to point you back to the contract we signed, and I'm going to remind you of this. And in my fresh out of treatment arrogance, I was like, I, there is nothing you can ask me to do that I will not do. I am, I am willing to do whatever it takes to recover from alcoholism and drug addiction. And then I get to amends. And my mind changes, you know, it's like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean you want me to go make it right with this church? <laughs> and, um, I don't know, God, God put it on my heart to, uh, I just couldn't drive past that stupid church again. And so I, I went in there and, uh, you know, I owned it. I just, no ifs, ands, or buts that, you know, and I, Y'all may do better amends than me. This is how I was taught to do it. So maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. So I go in there and I say, these are the things I've done. Keep it to what I did, not to what anybody else did. It has nothing to do with anybody else. Um, what can I do to make it right? Anything I missed? What can I, what can I do to make it right? And so they... Uh, and like, to, you know, I, I've been, I'm a felon. I know statute of limitations. Like the statute of limitations is not up on this crime. Like it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty recent. But uh, I was willing to do whatever it took to recover from alcoholism and drug addiction. Or, or just alcoholism, sorry. Uh, outside issue. <laughs> so they, uh, they asked me how I did it. I told them, uh, they asked who was involved. I said, if somebody needs to fall on the sword, I'll I'll fall on the sword. If I need to go to prison for this, I'm willing to go to prison for this. Um, And so they uh, they said, for the rest of your life, we want you to uh, help alcoholics and drug addicts. Some of y'all know me in here. For the rest of my life, I haven't died yet. If I die tonight, you know, I, I, I've, I've lived out that amends. Um, I, I, my purpose is to help alcoholics and drug addicts. Most days I think I do a pretty decent job of that. Um, second amends is uh, my grandpa. My grandpa taught me more about being a man than, than anybody on this planet. Uh, he's one of those people that... Uh, put it to you like this. I I was arguing with my mom one time and he said, what are you doing? And I was like, she's crazy and rah, 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 rah. And I was like, you've never argued with her? And he said, no, I've never argued with a woman in my life. Anybody that's a man, like how, like that's tough. And my, and my granddad means that he he never, and he taught me everything decent that I know about what a man is supposed to be. And uh, 
he died. I was strung out. I was in the hospital with him when he died. And, uh, you know, all of the terrible stuff that we do, the people that we love, you can imagine, run the gambit of that. I did those things. And uh, so I, uh, I went and made a graveside amends that I thought was stupid. I wrote out the letter. I, I drove to the graveside. I sat there. I, 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 I boo-hooed. Um, and I don't know, some, it was like a peace came over me when I got to the end of that amends. And, you know, I, God doesn't speak to me audibly, but it was like one of those things that was like downloaded into my soul where it was, you know, live your life in a manner which honors my memory. Live your life in a manner that I would be proud of, that, uh, that exemplifies the, the types of principles and characteristics that, uh, that he carried. And so I keep this picture of my granddad up at the house. So a visual learning of, of this, this is the goal of the, cause he wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't have to learn, you know, how to live by principles through a stupid 12 step program. Like he was just a good dude that knew how to do that. Like we've got a whole book and we come to these meetings and conventions to learn these things. And he just inherently knew how to be the kind of human that we're all hopefully esteeming to be. And, um, a lot, I'm going to talk about three amends. Um, probably the most powerful amends was, uh, one that maybe one of my best friends on the planet just made to me tonight. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we rob people. I, I say we, I rob people when they come to me trying to make an amends and I do the stupid AA thing where I'm like, it's, it's okay. Like, you're just doing the best you can with what you like, you know, it's typically AA cliches. And, and we, I, I don't give people a platform to really get through a healing process. And, uh, I'm talking like 30 minutes ago, like we, we got to have like a, a spiritual connection conversation where, you know, he was able to get free. I hope he was able to get free of some things that had been blocking him from the sunlight of the spirit. And I was able to connect with somebody that I love. And without that amends process, I don't get to be like my my granddad and without that amends process I don't get to connect with other humans and without that I don't get to feel the unity that that you guys have offered me for the entire time I've been here um, I'm, I'm really glad that I actually I, listen I was not looking forward to coming to this event I wasn't looking forward to speaking at this thing and uh, I've had this giant AA resentment y'all do that? anybody do that? sure <laughs> <laughs> I like it's number two on the resentment list. Like if you got like a top twenty-five, you know, like Bama here, Tennessee, where we're we're like way down there. But like AA's top five resentment right now, and uh, this has almost been like one of those processes where like I get to heal with Alcoholics Anonymous because y'all y'all pissed me off good in the last three years. And, uh, but I, I, I'm very grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very grateful that it's, uh, it's given me a chance to learn how to live by those principles that my grandfather just lived by because he's a good dude like that. Thank you all. All right, I'm Ryan. I'm an alcoholic. For the first hour of this talk, I'm really going to get drill it down. Man, this is my wheelhouse, and I talk about a ticket to freedom, and it's through the nine step amends process. I want to circle the wagons back really quick, and I want to, I'm remiss by not following up on what I said about my son. The coolest thing is our dark past is our most vital asset. With it, we can avert misery and death for them. And there's about four men right over there that one that was in a custody battle just like me that laid down his sword. And he's sitting right there, and he's married now, and he's got his kids more than he could ever imagine and want. And he spent the last seven, four or five weeks arranging all that just so he could be here with you. Another one sitting there, I got to teach his kids how to ride a bike. You see, that was robbed from me. 
because I was a drunk and I wasn't able to do that with my kids. But God gave me a do-over. You see, Alcoholics Anonymous allows me to go through that again and and do that. And uh, the nine step amends process um, is indescribably amazing. Um, And some of my most powerful amends have been many years in recovery because I used to be that arrogant guy that sat up at this podium and say, my list's complete. I am current with today. All my, you know, my amends list that I had, I had the lines across it. And you know what I found, guys, is, are you kidding me? You see, Alcoholics Anonymous is like a rock in a pond. You throw that sucker up and it hits the water and all those ripples come out, and that's all the people we affect by our alcoholism. And I can't fathom. I can only tell you if, I'm, if you knew me before June 10th, 2009, come see me after this meeting because I probably owe you an amends. <laughs> but I can tell you what God and Alcoholics Anonymous, 12 steps, sponsor a home group. You take that same rock and you throw it up and it hits the water and all those ripples is a loving hand of God. And some of the most powerful amends that ever came to me was many years into my sobriety that never made a list. And for those of you that know me, I'm deep in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I write, I do all those things. And never once did any of these amends that I'm getting ready to talk about ever hit one. I'm in a grocery store with my beautiful wife, Allison, who's going to be here tomorrow at 1. She's the A talk. Come see her. She'll be on this panel tomorrow. And we're standing at the meat counter. We're standing at the meat counter, and we're talking to a lady that worked with me, and she'd retired. And we're like, oh, it's so great. You're retiring. And I look down the aisle, and here comes this big old guy with bib overalls on. Something about bib overalls. Here he comes. No, he had a suit. This is a different, different one. He had a suit on. And he's coming down the bread aisle. And I struck me, and I said, oh, my God, Allison. <gasps> give me a second. She said, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, oh, give me a second. You see... Seven, eight years earlier in one of my drunken hazes, I stopped at this guy's tire shop because I blew out a tire because I was drunk and I hit the curb and I had to go there to get a tire. You know how the story goes. And I go and he says, buddy, you should buy the warranty. I'm like, I'm not buying your stupid warranty. It's a rip off. And I'm drunk and he sells me the tire. And of course, I go out drunk and blow the tire out the next day and go back and expect him to give me another one. He says, buddy, you didn't buy the warranty. And I cuss him and do all the awful things that that I do. I'm not going to put we in there, what I do. And I go about my rest of my time, don't ever go there, don't ever go to that shop, don't ever go there. That guy's a crook, and I character assassinate him all through the community. And there I am in a Piggly Wiggly with my wife, and here he is. Never hit a list, but Alcoholics Anonymous, that night step says wherever possible. Not whenever, it says wherever possible. So in a bread aisle, I make the approach. Sir, can I have a moment of your time? And I'm seven years sober, solid in this book, and I'm, I'm shaking like a like a leaf. And he says, well, yes, do I know you? I said, yes, you do. I said, I've harmed you, sir. And this is what I've done. And he listened intently. And he looked me in the eyes. And I said, I really need to know how this makes you feel. And I really didn't know if I left anything out. And I shut up and I listened. And that man looked at me and he put his hands down on my face and he smiled And he said, son, you need to understand one thing. I don't recall that day because God doesn't allow me to hold hate in my heart. You see, I'm a Baptist preacher, and I can see God in your eyes. And whatever you're doing, son, please keep doing it. And I'm so grateful for you to know that I love you. And he hugs me, and I hug him, and we cry like somebody shot us in the foot. And I duck down by the Captain Crunch, and I'm having a meltdown. And here comes Allison going, oh, my God, are you okay? And I said, I'm better than okay. I'm more than okay. You see, and when I see that man today, he's, hey, Ryan, how are you doing? Fast forward a couple years, I'm coming home from a job that God gave me because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because God gave me a degree, because you people drove me 100 miles a day to college every day when I didn't have a driver's license. And I get to walk home because I get to work next to my house. And I'm walking home for lunch. The night before, Allison and I said, I wonder what happened to Dean. Dean was a guy that, well, Larry knows him, but he was a guy that a friend of ours that went to the big meeting in Sky Sponsor. And we loved him. And so I haven't talked to Dean forever. God's honest truth, guys. I'm walking home the next day. And my phone rings, and it's Dean. He says, hey, Ryan, what's going on? I said, oh, my God, Dean, we've been talking about you. And he says, well, I'm walking down the street. And he says, I met a guy last night from Point Pleasant. and His name was Brent. 
I said, Brent Bailey? I mean, he's from Parkersburg. Yeah, I've been sponsoring Brent for years. He says, no, not Brent Bailey. And he told me his last name. I'm not going to say it from this podium. But he says, yes, I met him. I said, I, I'm a teacher now, and I'm going to a noon meeting yesterday. I haven't been to in years, and something just told me I need to go to this meeting. I don't know why, but that's pulled in this meeting. And there's this new guy. And I'm like, hi, new guy. How are you? And you're from Point Pleasant. Oh, you know, Ryan, he said his head dropped. His shoulders sank, his jaws clenched. He said, a lot of choice words. He said, that guy's a jerk, and I'll leave it at that. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. Ryan Corvo from Point Pleasant, now Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, oh, yeah, I know him very well. I don't want nothing to do with that. And I'm walking up the street, and I'm thinking, what's he talking about? And I stop at a stop sign. I look from here probably to the other side of the men's restroom, and there's a tennis court. And 20 years earlier, I savagely assaulted that man in his car. And did a lot of physical harm to him. And I'll leave it at that because it doesn't matter. And a blackout drunk. And I never even knew it. And I mean, I never even never hit any of my lists. And I said, oh, can you please, can you please, can you please give him my, can you please, please, please give him my number? I will. And I, and I was speaking at a meeting in Parkersburg, West Virginia, guys. This is the God's honest truth because these people were here with me when this happened. The very next week we go up there, we're late. We couldn't find the place. I walk in. This place was packed, 150 people. This hawk of a man in bib overalls, see how I got confused, comes walking up to me. And Mr. AA here says, hi, new guy. How are you doing? You know, I'm Mr. AA. And he says, oh, I know you. I'm Brent. And I'm getting to the get ready of the podium in five minutes, and I about fall over. I said, come here a second. And I took him in the coat closet, which I thought. And I said, Brent, I've harmed you, and this is what I've done. I think I've done, because by now I know. And he started crying, and his jaws clenched up. And he said, you don't have a clue what you've done to me, buddy. I've raised two kids for the last 20 years to deal with jerks like you. And he went on and on and on and told me under no certain circumstances what I did to him in his life. And I said, buddy, that's not the man you see sitting in front of you. Is there anything at all I can do to make this wrong right? I will do. And he started crying. He said, you already did. I said, buddy, how long have you been in the program? He says, he told me. He says, you're not going to believe this, Ryan. I'm just now starting on my ninth step. And we're crying, and then my wife falls out of the women's restroom because we stand in front of the women's restroom, and she's crying. And I go to the podium, and I tell that little story at the end of that talk, and the whole room's crying. And the next morning, we're sitting on my couch. And she's here to tell you that this is the true story. She comes out, and we have our prayer and meditation. She sits beside me. She lays her hand on my knee and says, have you heard anything from Brent? And my phone goes, bzzz. And my phone says, dear Ryan, I got to go home last night and tell my wife about you and I. And we both enjoyed a spiritual experience. This is the first time I've ever been able to be truthful with her and tell her what happened. And I want you to know I love you. Twenty years of hatred gone away like that because of God and Alcoholics Anonymous. Flash forward a month later, we're doing a family afterward talk at a district and there's a guy standing next to Brent, even bigger. At the end of the talk he comes up to me and he says, I want you to meet my son Brent. He drove into North Carolina to meet you. And I'm thinking, uh oh. And that boy grabs me and starts crying. He says, thank you for helping save my dad's life. That's only in the power of God and Alcoholics Anonymous. How free do you want to be? If you're sitting on something, get out there and get it done. With God, anything's possible, guys. I absolutely love you. I'll pass. Chair, count me. I'm David Alcoholic. Uh... Man, that's some powerful stuff, guys. Aren't you glad they didn't ask us to explain the 12 concepts of service tonight? <laughs> that's for the women? Yeah, good, good, good choice. Um, I, I, I got a couple as well. Um, the first time I went to my ex-in-laws to make amends to them, I was back in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. And we were living in their house because uh, just the way it was back then. I was newly sober and trying to reunite with that ex-wife, and it, and it was horrible. It didn't work. 
Uh, it was before all the custody stuff got really bad, and uh, I said, "Can I, you know, I, I want to sit down with uh, you two, her parents, and make amends." And they heard me out, you know. And I said, "Is there anything I can do?" And they I said, well, "Well, we'll think about it," you know. And uh, they came back to me the next day, and you can start by changing the fan belt on the car. When you're done with that, you can mow the lawn, clean out the shed. And they gave me a list of tasks to perform for the harm that I had done. And, <laughs> okay. And I did all those things. And they never stopped for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I felt like a slave. And, and I just thought, you know, there's something ain't right about this, you know. And... uh Anyway, I ended up leaving, got in the car, left, never looked back. Well, fast forward about 10 or 12 years. I can't remember exactly how long I had been sober, but my daughter was in a very bad relationship. Fresh out of high school, getting her own place, meeting boys and doing all that stuff. And, and she got involved with a guy that was very similar to me. Kind of treated my daughter the way I treated my ex-wife. And uh, I was driving to work, and I was out in the middle of the desert, and, I'm, and there's like miles of nothing out there. And all I wanted to do was turn my truck around and go kill this kid. Like literally had hatred in my heart for this kid. And so I called my sponsor, and I said, you know, I, I need to talk to you. This, I, this is what's going on. And uh, he says, well... He says, I don't have any experience with anything like that. Do you know anybody that does? It's been in that same situation that you're in. And the only person I could think of was my ex-father-in-law. And I said, he's, he's the only guy. He said, why don't you call him and ask his advice? I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? I don't even know his phone number. It's been years since I talked to this man. And uh, so I called my ex. I said, give me your dad's number. You know, of course, she's like, why? You know, and I didn't tell her why. I just said I need to talk to him. Anyway, she ended up giving me the number, and I called him, and he was home. And, he, and I got him on the phone for a couple of minutes, and we're exchanging pleasantries. And, you know, you can, these people hated me, hated me. And I could hear his wife in the background screaming at him, Hang up the phone! Don't you dare talk to him! And he said, Leave me alone. And I explained the situation to him. And I told him, I called my AA sponsor, and he said to call somebody that had been in the same situation, and you're the only one that I could think of because I used to treat your daughter that way. And I know how damaging that was. And I went on to say a few things. Like, it wasn't just the fact that I treated your daughter that way. It was the fact that you never got to see the grandkids. That we deliberately avoided answering the phone when you would call. You would want to come out and visit, and we would tell you, no, we're too busy. And we robbed you of being grandparents to those kids. And... and uh, and my first attempt at trying to explain all these things to you was, was um, I didn't understand it. But here recently, I understand it in, in a different level, you know. And uh, he went on to tell me what he experienced when he went through all that stuff. And it wasn't good. I mean, there was a three-day period where he was out with a shotgun looking for me. And... Uh, we ended the conversation with, I, I asked him, I said, what was the most significant thing that you did that helped you through that period? And he said, prayer. And he was a very religious man. And uh, I said, that's all I got right now. And he said, that might be all you got. Good, good luck. And that was it. But in the 
you, you, you have to be there in those conversations because something healed that day between me and that man. And my sponsor told me it's because you recognized his pain. You didn't just say, I did this and I did that. And, you know, fire at will. You know. And that's kind of the way I went into it the first time. But when I called him back this time, and I wasn't even really calling to make an amends to him. That wasn't my purpose. But I ended up having that conversation with him, and I recognized his pain. And, and, and it's just the course of the conversation, and there was some healing that took place. And the future times that I had to see him because of the kid's graduation or whatever, um, we ex exchanged pleasantries that were actually pleasant. And me and him are never going to be fishing buddies. Never were. Right? But something happened that day. The other one was uh, in, when I was young in Omaha, Nebraska. We used to pull the weed. They, the, the pot used to grow wild in the creeks. And it had no THC content in it. It wouldn't get you stoned. It was just, they made rope out of it. It was hemp. And we used to dry it out, bag it up, and take it down, sell it to the bums in downtown Omaha, and make a few bucks, and and go out and buy booze with it. And uh, and we did that a lot. And uh, for some reason, when I went through my, it says, "Do you have any amends that you need that you don't have any resentments in connection with?" And that's what I thought of was. Like, it's stealing, basically. You know, those guys didn't have much money in what they did have because, you know, we'd smoke a good joint with them and then they'd want to buy some and we'd sell them this junk and they thought they got a good deal. And, and we did it over a summer in high school and uh, he said, well, how much do you think you made off of that, money-wise? And conservatively, I said, oh, probably about 800 bucks. It may have been more, it may have been less, I, I don't remember, but I, I told him probably about 800 bucks. He says, okay, I want you to go down. Your tax return is going to be coming. It was around this time of year. And he said, you're going to get your tax return back. He says, I want you to go down to the, take $100 out of your tax return and go down to the Walmart or wherever and go down to the homeless shelter and ask those people what they need. And I did that. I went down and she said, don't bring canned goods and food. We got plenty of that, but we need hygiene items. We need sanitary things for the women. We need shaving kits for the men. We need this and that. And, and so I went down to the store and I got my tax return and I bought $100 worth of the stuff and, and, uh, and I brought it down there to him. And he told me not to give it to the lady behind the counter. He says, I want you to stand out there and hand it to these guys and tell them why you're doing it. And so I did that. And the next year I took $100 and I did it again. And the next year I took $100 and I did it again. And I did that until it, that was paid off. But in the process of doing that, what happened is some of the people at the, I was a plumbing contractor out in California, and some of the people that were working around me, not with me or for me, but around me in the supply house and other plumbers knew my situation. I'd been known in that town, you know, as a plumbing contractor, and, and these guys knew who I was. And they found out what I was doing with the homeless people. And the girl behind the counter at the supply house said, Hey, man, we'd like to get in on that. You think they could use some socks? They probably need coats and blankets. And all of a sudden, she started asking the other plumbers in there in town to, uh, to join in. And at Christmas time every year, we were buying, giving away all these things for these homeless people. And it ins what it did is, I didn't have a resentment in connection with that. I just owed these, this community of people, I needed to give back to society what I had taken. And it instilled the principle of charity in me. And, and, I, and I started to feel the joy of being able to give these guys back something that they desperately needed. And, uh, and we started... You know, our company started donating to other places and other charities and whatnot, and I got to learn what it's like to be able to do those things, which I never was able to do before. And, uh, and, it, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Do I got a couple more minutes? No? We'll go ahead. No. Well, Marion decided to go down to the local, uh, like, homeless 
place. I don't know, they helped homeless people, you know, and she said, what can we do for you guys? And uh, they said, well, we adopt families around Christmas. And she went down to the, uh, got a hold of this lady. They gave us a family to adopt for Christmas. And we went down. The lady had diabetes, and she's missing a leg from her diabetes and slept on a mattress in the living room, and the kids had the bedrooms. These people had nothing. And uh, she said, well, you know, you guys signed up for the Christmas deal, and we're going to bring Christmas. And they were happy about it. And <laughs> Marion asked the little boy who was losing his sight. He was blind, legally blind, and he would be totally blind in a short time. His glasses were that thick. And she said, what do you want for Christmas? And he said, I want an easy-bake oven. And he said, well, that's a, strange, that's a strange gift for a little boy to ask for. Why do you want that? And he said, because my mom loves chocolate chip cookies, and she can't stand up there and make them. So that kid got an easy-bake oven with about 50 packages of chocolate chip cookies to make for his mom. And the little girl got past us to the movies, and we took care of that family. And when we did that, my family found out about it. And my mom said, can I put a gift basket together for him? And we said, sure, Mom. And my sisters got involved in it. And Marion orchestrated the whole thing. But you know what? That was the best Christmas that family ever had. And uh, that's because I paid $100 a year back to the homeless people because I felt this charitable thing inside me to where it's okay to do those things. And uh, pretty cool. Thanks. Wow. Just give them a hand. That was amazing. Uh.